Well, we've made it to the Q&A. That's good. Anyway, we'll entertain questions about pretty much anything re relating to uh, my big toe. We have one taker. The rest of you, if you feel like you have a question, just get up, kind of get in, get in line or get in, make, a, make a little cue. Okay, well, let's get the first question. Tom, first and foremost, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for all of the countless years that you've spent researching consciousness. Um, you opened up a number of doors for many people who not only didn't know such things existed, you know, but it, it opened up the ability to be able to experience the way that you help us to understand it. And I applaud you, sir. Thank you. Um, having said that, my question is, what experiments have you done to disprove the notion that experiences in consciousness are not simply training the human mind, the gray matter, to access the dream state at will while awake? In other words, how do you know that um, the uh, trips that you take are are uh, something outside of you rather than inside of you. Yes, sir. It's the inside outside data. Okay. That requires some experience. And the reason that there's a problem with making a distinction is because what you get is data. You get information, you interpret that information, and you interpret that information as your reality, let's say. One of the sources of that data is your own imagination. So you have many sources of data. You'll have a source, say the data stream you get from this reality. Maybe you're also connected to uh, some other reality, you know, on a, out of body or something else. You'll get that data stream. You may still hear a car honking, you know, out in the street or whatever. So you kind of get some of this reality and you have an imagination that can make up data itself. And all of that data comes at you, and none of it has tags on it that says, you know, this is where this comes from. You interpret that. You interpret the horn out in the parking lot because you heard that before, so it fits a pattern. So you put that in the parking lot. Okay, you, uh, if, you, if you've experienced a lot outside of this reality, then you can put those things there. But the way you, the way you understand that it's not just you is through experiencing things that are extremely unlikely to be you. In other words, sometimes you will get information and you will see and, and get things that just aren't in you. It's very foreign to the way you think. It's very foreign to anything that you would make up or even guess. It's just takes you a while. It's like, huh? You know, what is that? And then maybe even over days you can maybe piece it together, come up some, you have hard times come up with metaphors for things because you don't have the metaphors. You see, when we do that, when we do that uh, uh, interpretation of the data, we have to do it in terms of what we know, what our experience is. So what our experience is is all this uh, physical matter reality experience that we've got. So when you get something that doesn't fit, you make up the best metaphor you can for it. You know, you get like the, the closest approximation, like a pattern match. You match that pattern as well as you can, and that's as good as you're going to get with it. Other than that, it's just, I don't know what that was. You can't do anything with it. But sometimes I've gotten information from other entities, sometimes just putting it together from things I've seen, and I know that... I didn't make that up because if I'd have made it up, it'd have been different. I wouldn't. That wasn't what I expected. You know, it wasn't what I anticipated. It was nothing at all like what I thought. And so you have those experiences. And if you have enough of them, they find consistency. So that's why the horn is consistent with things you already know. If you explore other realities, they get eventually to be consistent with things that you know there. So that's how you separate it. But now, that's not a sure thing, right? That's not a zero or a one. That's a probability. 
Well, that comes back to living gracefully with uncertainty. But the real clincher is that it doesn't matter. It really isn't important. The question isn't, where did this come from? The real important question is, what value is it? How can I grow from this? What is it about this that lets me see a bigger picture, understand things better, uh, you know, makes my life happy or whatever? That's the thing. Because let's say something, you know, something comes out of your own consciousness and it does make your life better. You understand something. It's an aha moment for you. That's terrific. Would you discount that because it came out of your own consciousness? No. And if you got something out of the larger conscious system and it just didn't make sense, you couldn't use it, don't know what to do with it, well, you know, well, toss it away. It's not valuable. So the real thing is, what's valuable? What can you use? And where does it come from? That's one of those things you have to, you have to uh, kind of decide through your own experience where it comes from. Now, if things come from outside of you, you think they come from outside of you. Um, you can test some of those, just like you can test things here. But you'll never get a zero or a one because all the data is mixed together and there really isn't any objective way to separate it. It's subjective data. So there is no objective separation. But in the, in the end, it doesn't make any difference. It's all about getting things that you know. So if this, if this non-physical context is a context that works for you, and you get information and there's connections there, well then, you know, that's good. Now there's other things you can do, like remote viewing. So you can do a remote viewing and you see something. You go to some coordinates and you see a tennis court and you see two people playing tennis or whatever, and then you find out that it, indeed it was a tennis court. All right, now how did you do that? You see, now you have, a, now you have something that isn't, you know, uh, iffy. You did get that information. It wasn't physical. You can get information that's not physical that is very accurate. Okay, now is that some, some thing that uh, you know your brain did well that doesn't really make a lot of sense because that's how does it know about the tennis court that's on you know some other country someplace where this viewing was so you kind of get those ideas lets you know that your your consciousness travels in a larger space than just the physical reality that we think of so that's a that's kind of a fact that we know um, couple that with your experience and if you interpret your experience as visiting, um, you know, planets and other solar systems, that's your interpretation. And that may be just the way it seems to you. I just call that a metaphor. It's just your metaphor. It's your best pattern match to what you see. So I wouldn't say it's not a hard thing like, well, does that place really exist? You know, it is it really on the backside of the moon of Jupiter, you know, which is what you think it is. It doesn't matter. It's really not important where it is. What value is it to you? You see, so trying to put things in boxes as to exactly where they come from is often, we do that because we want to be certain. We want to know, is it this way or you know, is it that? Is it really that moon and Jupiter or is it not? Is it someplace else? Those questions aren't really good questions. Those questions are generally put out by our ego. Our ego wants the certainty. And since it doesn't really matter because we're looking for value, then we live gracefully with the uncertainty. But there's a lot of things that are uncertain. But you deal with them anyway because your experience says that this is real. This is good information. This is helpful. And you know, that's enough. It doesn't, get, it doesn't get any more real than you think it's real. And that's true about anything. So I think you're looking for a kind of an objective evaluation where there can't be any because it's subjective data. And it's an it's a, uh, intuitive kind of call based on your experience, what you, what you think and know. But when it gets right down to it, it's all metaphors. 
You know, when I talk about the larger consciousness system as a big computer, it's a metaphor. When you talk about the uh, higher selves and free will awareness units and individual units of consciousness, they're all metaphors. There's functions in consciousness that do those things, and we give the function a name. We call it a free will awareness unit. That's a name for, for the function that gets uh, connected to the avatar. But it's just a function, and the free will awareness is just a, just a metaphor for that function. So we tend to deal that way with everything. So all reality is uh, uncertain. This reality is uncertain. There's, you know, we think we have things that are certain in our lives, but there's very little that's certain in anybody's life. If you, uh, you, know, you think you know who your parents are, well, you grew up with them. They claimed you and whatever, but do you know that you weren't switched as a baby and nobody knows about it? except somebody else, and you don't. You see, is that certain? No. It's almost, you know, I mean, the most basic things that we take as being fundamental truths are still uncertain if we're looking, if we're talking about objective facts. There's really, it's very, very hard to prove objectively anything. Well, you could take a DNA test, and you could see, and if you're compatible with your parents, that's good, but... That's not necessarily proof either, because there's a certain group of people that would all get that same test. You know, the DNA isn't, isn't that good that it's down to an, a single individual. There's a limited group of people that would, you know, have the same values that you might have. So, anyway, life is just like that. And it's better to accept it as uncertainty, use it as metaphors, and don't take any of it too seriously. So when you feel like you just had a conversation with somebody that lives on the dark side of the moon in some other universe or planet. That's a metaphor. It's your best pattern match. It's a guess. And you shouldn't get too interested or too wound up around that being a fact as opposed to what did you learn from that. So a lot of the things I say, I wouldn't make them ones. You know, things I've been, places I've gone. I'm just giving you the best description I can. But do I know that that was exactly that way, that place? No. There's no way that you, you know. So one of the first things you learn is that you don't know nearly as much as you, as you think you do. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in life. And you have to realize that even not knowing who your parents are, for sure, because who knows what happened that, you don't know. You know, you just accept life's like that. So I, I know where you're coming from, though. Everybody would like to know for sure that what they're doing is real. Well, my thought is real, reality comes from the value, not from the place. Is it valuable to you? If it's valuable to you, then whether you imagined it or whether you saw it someplace else really isn't all that important. Could you say that those who have had, let's say someone who has died on the operating table for five minutes and had the proverbial out of body, that whole experience is just their interpretation of the data stream? Yes, they'll get a data stream. They'll get out. I mean, everything's a data stream. When you, when you die, you just hook into a different data stream. The reality you end up in after you get out of this reality is another virtual reality. It's a different rule set. It's, everything's a virtual reality. Consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental. A virtual reality means that it's a reality that you construct, okay, out of information. Well, just, you know, you'd have consciousness itself, but just for consciousness to communicate with another consciousness requires a virtual reality in as much as you require communication protocols so that you know you know what I mean when I make these noises, and I know what you mean when you make those noises, and we can't do that without some kind of communication rules. So we have to set up a rule set that defines meaning to sounds or to motions or to something so we can communicate. And that little rule set is kind of your, your uh, zero order virtual reality, if you will. That's a rule set that determines limitations of what it is we can do. So everything's a virtual reality. You get into a different virtual reality after you pass from this one, and uh, in that virtual reality, you get a data stream. You do that in all realities. 
And in that data stream, you may see the bright light that comes, and it's awesome, and it's love, and you feel connected with everything. And that's a real experience. And that experience for a lot of people is very important. It's life changing. And I'd say that makes that a, a real experience. And it doesn't matter really where the, the source is, but I would say it's just a data stream. And those NDEs, you know, it's hard to tell. Again, you don't know for sure, but most of those NDEs, I think, are given that experience quite purposely. It's not that they get out and they just happen to look at the right place and see that because, you know, that's, that's what's there. They are given that information in their data stream because it's supposed to be an eye-opener. It's supposed to be a life changer. It's supposed to be a message you take back and tell other people. And that's why they get it. And it's just data put in their data stream. See, every time we think we look out and see something, it's data in the data stream. So how do we know what it's real? You see, what's real there? Data in the data stream is real. And we interpret it. Sometimes it's, our, it's ourselves creating the data. Sometimes it comes from someplace else. So in a way, you could say, well, nothing's real. You know, it's all just information. Or you could say, everything's real. It's information. Information is the only thing that is real. So I don't know, have I helped? Oh, yes. OK. I don't know if I've helped you or confused you. But... Oh, no, no. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I took a long time on that, because I think almost everybody in here has that same has that same issue. I got a question about, um, I've been trying to think and conceptualize to myself or feel what is uh, infinity and <clears throat> what is that in relation to what I am? Okay, infinity, now maybe it's just because I'm a physicist and you know, physicists do math, that infinity is a, it's an abstract concept. It doesn't exist. In mathematics, you can never get to affinity. You can only approach it. It's an impossible thing to get to because if you actually got to it, you could always add something to it. And now it wouldn't have been infinity anymore, you see. So you can't get there. This largest number isn't accessible. It's a concept. It doesn't exist. Now, anything that is real, that has real function, has to be finite. It can't be infinite. If it's infinite, it needs infinite energy and infinite resources and infinite, you know, everything has to be infinite to support it. And nothing real is like that. Everything real has boundaries. Now, boundaries big up, bring up another issue. If it has boundaries, let's say the larger consciousness system, okay? All right, it's a real system. Therefore, it can't be infinite because that's just an abstract concept. Infinite doesn't exist. Nothing real is infinite. So it's finite. Well, if it's finite, it's got a beginning and an end, right? It's got boundaries. Well, what are outside the boundaries of the larger consciousness system? Well, that's conjecture that there, you know, something out there. There might be, but we'll never know because we are consciousness. We're pieces of the system. And as pieces of the system, we can't get out of the system to look back at ourselves independently. We have to only have the view from the system of consciousness. So there's some things you just can't know. And that's one of them. You know, you can't watch yourself being born because you haven't been born yet. That's why you can't watch yourself being born. There's this, this is a logical problem. We can't get out of consciousness to see what's outside the boundary because we are consciousness. So we don't know. So we can speculate about what's outside, you know, and in the books I do some imaginative and some humorous speculation, you know, that's uh, you know, that, that uh, our consciousness system is just one cell, you know, in a bigger system. But that's just making that up. You see, it, that doesn't mean that that's true. Or you could say there's nothing outside there. You know, there's just the void outside of the system. But that's making that up too. It's just that you can't tell. So we can speculate if we like, but uh, we just have to, it's one of those uncertainties that you have to live with. We don't know what's outside those boundaries. And if anything is outside those boundaries, it really has boundaries too. See? It's just the word infinite. Now, a lot of people use the word infinite as something really, really big. It means, you know, just something bigger than you can imagine. And infinite is just the word for that. 
and that's fine then. That's just the general use of the word infinite. You know, I, one of the examples I give, if I'm floating in an inner tube in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, that ocean looks infinite to me. Day after day after day, I look and I see the same thing in every direction. Well, it's not infinite. It just seems that way because it's so much bigger than I am. Well, the larger consciousness system is so much bigger than we are that we kind of have this idea, oh, it's infinite. But if we just use that as a metaphor of really, really, really big, then sure, it's infinite in that sense. But if we use infinity in the more specific form, like math would use it or physics would use it, then that's an impossibility. So does that, does that, that help you? I have a lot of people get, have a problem with the infinity thing because I'll say the larger kinds of system is finite and that just, they don't like that because they want it to be infinite. But I think they're thinking really big, big beyond imagination. And then that's fine, use the word infinite. And I say, well, it's not really infinite. It can't be infinite or it couldn't be real. And maybe it's just a math guy with the non-math people that are having a conflict of, uh, you know, semantical, you know, conflict there. Thank you. Tom, thanks. Uh, I think you've lowered my entropy both physically and non-physically. Uh, my question here is, do you think that uh, this magnetic, uh, north and south magnetic monopoles are the same as the protons and electrons? If yes, uh, how, if no, why? Because my, my thinking is that uh, if it is different. Mag the magnetic monopoles are more, I mean, they are in random motion, more statistical and probabilistic. So do you think that it will, ch it will affect the double s slit experiment when it is viewed from a magnetic point of view? Because my thinking is that maybe J.J. Uh, Thompson uh, I misnamed uh, maybe the uh, soft magnetic monopole as electron. So it could have been called a magnetricity instead of electricity. I don't think there's a. I don't think that you can say that uh, protons and uh, other charged particles, electrons or whatever, are the same as magnetic monopoles. The uh, of course, if you look at um, Maxwell's equations, one of his equations is there are no such things as monopoles, magnetic monopoles. That's one of his equations. They don't exist. Magnets have to come with a north and south pole. They don't come just with a south pole or just with a north pole. It's part of a part of a binary logic, and you can't have one without the other. That they're necessary, and that that uh, magnetic monopoles are an impossibility. Now, charge is different. Magnetic fields are different than just charge, but they're related. You see, so how do you get how do you get a piece of iron to become magnetic? Well, you take all the little molecules and you arrange them in such a way that all the plus sides are this way and all the minus sides are that way, but they're dipoles, right? They're little pluses and minus dipoles. And you take those molecules, which happen to be able to be movable in iron, and they happen to be little dipoles. The molecule is, you know, longer than it is wide, I guess. And you get all those to line up. Now you have a magnet, but they're little dipoles. That's the, that's the, that's, the fundamental idea with physics. So when you talk about a charge like a proton, that's different. Charge is not the same as magnetic. Now here we have charges in the dipole. We have positive and negative charges in a dipole and that does create a magnetic field because the field will go from one and around to the other. It's a closed loop. So magnetic fields seem to always come in dipoles and uh, otherwise single units we call charge. So that would say that it's just how we name things. We've got a single unit, we call it a charge. We get those, those charge units and dipoles, now we've got a magnetic field. So maybe that's, a, that's another semantic issue. But no, I don't think that you'd say that, uh, that, I don't think the scientists would agree with you to say that you get a magnetic monopole uh, is then a, a proton. See, I'm, a, I'm a employing an open-minded skepticism to ask the question, because yeah. if we can have a magnetic charge, I mean, it's possible, can we have magnetic charge? 
if that's the case, then uh, maybe what I was thinking about maybe is is related. That's the way uh, I'm looking at it. So I think saying a magnetic charge just doesn't uh, that language doesn't. Uh, compute in my sense of, uh, of physics. I don't know that we can have a magnetic charge. I think charge is different. Now, if you have, if you have charge in a dipole formation, now you have a magnetic, a magnetic field. But you need the two together to make a, to make a magnetic field. So I'm not sure what your application is, but uh, keep yeah, your keep that. your skepticism going because yeah, yeah. I don't know everything. No, no. Don't let me uh, rain on, they, a, on I a concept. I think with respect to the I mean, magnetic dipole, I think there's an experiment that shows that, that you can separate them. See that you can separate them and it can also recombine. I mean, that is uh, some of the experiment uh, I've read. I mean, okay. I try to research into. So my thinking is that if that's the case, maybe it will, it's, it will affect it will affect the way we look at we look at the double slit experiment. I mean, pretty much that's the way. Uh, well, double slit experiment doesn't have to be done with charged particles. It could be done with anything. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. What I'm okay, uh, it's okay. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> okay, one more question. Uh, I think. Uh, if they can someone, I mean, take over, uh, use his or her intent to disable your free will awareness unit. Okay, can you use a free will intent to disable? Yeah, somebody. Somebody else's. Yeah, can yeah. you overrun somebody else's free will? Yeah. With yours? Yes. That's possible. You can do it here physically, and you can do it just with intent. Um, You know, there's nothing that forces you to be nice. Being nice has to be a choice that you make. So you can use your intent to heal. You can use your intent to hurt. You can, uh, you know, we have the, we have those people who are, who are healers, and we have those people who what do, uh, you know, voodoo or whatever else. They use their intent to hurt people, and. Uh, all of that is real. Yes, you can you can do that. Um, and how do we inoculate yourself from? How do you protect yourself yes, from that? Does okay. become in love or? Yes, the first way you can protect yourself from that is to be fearless. In as much as you have fear, that negative intent will connect with you, and it connects with you through your fear. So your fear kind of connects you to it. And that's why people who do that kind of thing, who do that negative work, part of their process is to frighten you first. That's why they send you the little doll with the thing in it. It's to frighten you, you see. It's not that that doll means anything at all in their process. The process is all mental. But that frightens you. And once you're frightened, that's a connection. Now you've got a direct line to that, and that makes it easy for them to affect you. So that's number one, become fearless. If you have no fear, they've got no way to actually access you. It's just like you're slippery and everything slides off, nothing sticks, you don't accept any of the energy, and it won't hurt you. And as much as you're fearful, you're an easy target. So, and the more fearful you are, the easier target that you are. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is you can use your own intent, if you like, to, again, it's metaphors. You can make metaphors that protect yourself. But now you have to realize when you make a metaphor, like you can take, you can surround yourself with light. And in your mind, your intent is that nothing nasty can come through that barrier. It's a block against all things nasty. That's your intent, okay? What you're really doing there isn't necessarily surrounding yourself with light. That's just a metaphor. That's a picture we give to it. What you're doing is, is making an intent to refuse any data or information that's negative. We, if we imagine that as the, as the thing of light, but that's the intention. Your intention can open up data links or close data links. So when you 
you know, when you remote view, you see those people in the tennis court. But you don't see those people in the tennis court all the time. It's not like you see everything going on in the world at once. It would be too confusing. You open up that, that data link because you have an intention to see that. And then when you're done, you close that and you don't see it anymore. So intention opens and closes these data links. And that's when you have that idea of protection, you're basically making an intent to not accept anything that isn't to your, you know, for your betterment. Anything that's going to help you grow, anything that's going to pull you down or whatever, you just don't want it. But you have to do that without being afraid of what it is you don't want. You see, if the reason you're making that protection is because you're terrified about something, then it's not going to work too well because you're, you're uh, making the protection intent good, but you're also making a big, bright target not so good. So you have to be able to have those clear intents, no fear of what you'll accept, what you won't, and uh, uh, just not worry about the, you know, worry will do you in. If you worry about what might happen, you'll help create that to happen. If you fear it, you, you help make it. Yeah, but all that is very real. Yeah. yeah, because I saw one guy in front of me who did the neuroscience, uh, neuroscience. I think he gave a talk at uh, TED where he designed an, uh, an, I mean, uh, some instrument where you can connect to your, your brain and, and to your arm. And then when you move it and so you connect to somebody's uh, arm, you can, I mean, take control of that person's arm. Hmm. See, so taking away that person's free will to, to make the motion. Yeah, you know, hypnotists will do that too, right? But it's a different, you know, it's, it's a little different thing. What you're just describing would only work if the people involved were open to it. If the person who was having their arm move really didn't want to play that game, they could block it. So it's not that they can't block it, it's that they don't want to, they're cooperative. See, hypnotism is similar. You can, you can hypnotize somebody and you can tell them, oh, I have a bright red apple for you here. Take a bite and it's really an onion. You know, so they take that onion and they bite it and they go, mmm, good. <laughs> yeah, well, they're hypnotized, right? Well, they know that they're biting an onion, but they have the sense, they have an urge, they have a need to cooperate, to do, you know, what they're asked to do, to be a part of it. So you might say that their will has been weakened to the point that now they feel obligated to, to, uh, you know, I wouldn't say play along, but to be a part of what's going on. They want to do that. It's not that they're really forced to do that, but they do. So that's kind of how hypnotism works. It, it deals more with your attitude and, and will than it has to do with actually mechanically making your taste buds taste apple when they taste onions. It's not really that way. So I'd say if that happened, my guess would be, you know, I'm just guessing. I wasn't there, but my guess yeah, actually, would be that... Uh, maybe I'll send you the, the video. Actually, he sent it to me, and he was spoke on test. Uh, we talked about a week ago, so I said maybe I should. <laughs> because in the statement, so they took the other person's free will away because they, they took control of his, his hand when the other person is moving the other hand. I would be very skeptical of that. I'd be very skeptical of that. You know, you can see something on video, almost anything. You know, okay. that's... That, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hello. Thank you for being here and having us here. Um, I have a question about um, the IUOC. Um, can an IOC individual unit of consciousness exist without being measured or observed within PMR or NPMR? In other words, does an IOC always need an observer? And can it be a thing in itself? And, or is it always supposed to be an, a measured phenomenon? I don't know if that makes no, sense. No, your individuated unit of consciousness isn't in this reality, right? It's in another reality. It's in the reality of consciousness. It's not in this reality. So you'll, you won't observe it here. Now, how do you re observe it if you're out there? How do you know, how do you meet other people who are individuated units of consciousness? Yes, you can observe them, but what you observe 
is your own it's, it's your own interpretation of the data. So you get data stream from something. Well, we immediately then assume that if it's from something, it's from a being. And then when we assume it's a being, we see it with a head and two arms and legs because it looks like us because that's our definition of a being. So now we see ourselves talking to this humanoid shape. Well, we've given the shape and all of it from our interpretation of the data because we're actually having a conversation and you don't have conversations with rocks or other things. It has to be a being and then the being looks like us. If it's not a friendly conversation, then maybe the being has two heads and fangs. You know, we can make a different interpretation. So the observation is really in the, in the mind of the person that's making the observation. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is what you're dealing with. That's one of the, that's part of this question of is it real or not, you see? No, the idea that it's a, it's a, you know, a man or a woman in a white dress with a purple robe and flowers in her hair, that's not necessarily real. What it, what's real is that you've made a connection with somebody and that's the image that they give to you. That's the feel that they have is that image. That's what's really real to you. Now, the other way that you can get that data is that the data is given to you. You can have, you know, the conscious system can give you data that you're going to interpret as a woman in a white dress with flowers in her hair, because that's the data they give you. And now it's not so much your interpretation that you're giving it, it's the interpretation really that's sent to you. You're just interpreting because you've got that, you've got that image, that's a perfect pattern match for you. You can imagine a woman in a white dress with flowers in her hair, it's easy. You see, so you get that data and you get it exactly right. So in that case, you describe the data accurately. In the other case, you made that data up because that was a best pattern fit to what you got. So we have to be a little careful about what we describe as real or not real. The information's real. The interpretation is our own. So uh, I guess this answers my other question was uh, about solipsism, you know, uh, the concept of that you're the only consciousness that exists and whatever you observe or measure uh, is a reflection of the data stream that you're getting. I guess that, that uh, yeah, I guess answers I, uh, my question. Yeah, I would not subscribe to that because the, the uh, you know, I, I see the utility in lots of people interacting, okay? If it's all just one, okay, then I'm the only one and all of you guys are just, you know, part of, part of my thing, right? You're just here to entertain me. You know, I'm, I'm here to talk and you're here to pretend you're the audience. But then every one of you feels like that too. So you feel that we're all just here so that you can get up and ask a question and whatever and you're doing your thing. Well, there doesn't seem to be you know, each, each one then requires a whole universe to support them, right? Every consciousness needs the whole planet, the whole universe to support them because that's their universe to play in. So that's a universe per consciousness. Seems like a very inefficient way to run a game, you know, a universe per consciousness. And besides, if you're just you and by yourself and nothing else, then it's very hard to learn much or grow much because where you learn and grow is by interaction, by running into things that are not like you, things that are different from you, ideas that you never thought of before. That's the kind of thing that, that stimulates growth. So now I can see something that's a lot more efficient, and that would be a virtual reality with all kinds of beings in it, all interacting and challenging each other with their stuff, you know, with their meanness as well as with their kindness, challenge you all over. So now I can see how we all feed each other. We're all each other's teachers. And we're all each other's students. That I see, and that makes sense, because now it's very efficient. Now you have all of these individuated units of consciousness all interacting, and the system doesn't have to plan a whole universe and then play, play with them in that universe. They create their own interaction. And because you have all these people with free will interacting, the possibilities are endless, huge possibilities. If it's just you and all the rest of the world is there to serve your whim, then it seems to me you're, you are in a very sterile situation that probably wouldn't be likely. So in a theoretical sense, 
you could have it either way, right? I mean, in theory, it could be that, uh, you know, everybody's in their own universe, but it wouldn't be practical. For what purpose? To what end? Okay. So it's, again, it's another one of these things, you know, theories are easy, but you have to find theories that actually work. And I have a, sa a very similar argument with the many worlds theory. In physics, there's a many worlds theory yes. that says, you know, it's similar to that, right? Yes. That every time you do something, another universe gets spread off. Okay, so I decide that, you know, I'm going to scratch this thing instead of doing this. Two universes just got birthed. <laughs> Two complete universes, you know, full of all of us just got birthed because I decided to do this instead of that. Well, to me, that isn't efficient. That's a very inefficient way to run a reality. And it's not that it's impossible, you know, it's not that theoretically that couldn't be, you know, that couldn't be done. It's just it doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to do that? Every time a, an atom changes state, well, now there's a universe that has that atom in it in this state and a universe that has that atom in it in that state. Every time a molecule vibrates or gets bumped, you can see you, the numbers of universes you need for every change is just outrageous. Now you need trillions of trillions of trillions of universes and that number would be growing geometrically because now all these trillions of universes are all doing things and they're all generating trillions of universes and yeah as a theory you can see that yeah theoretically that's a possibility but practically it just doesn't fly it doesn't make any sense so that's the same thing i have with the solipsism is that uh, yeah theoretically it's a possibility that it's just us and everything else is being imagined because you can see how that's a possibility but it doesn't make any practical sense to me that a system would be that way and because this is a real system a real system has boundaries and a real system has limited resources that's the nature of a real system real doesn't have infinite resources and if you've got limited resources or let's say finite resources because you're a finite system you can't be making trillions of billions of universes you know every microsecond because that's not practical you have to be efficient which is why this is a probabilistic virtual reality because that's efficient than all those ground up calculations you see that's you know that's why a lot of you know a lot of my theory follows along a principle of you know you want to do you want to get the biggest result out of the smallest investment. That's called parsimony in, in, uh, in uh, computational circles. So you want a parsimonious re result. And uh, the same idea comes across as uh, Occam's razor that says the thing with the fewest number of assumptions is likely to be more fundamental. It's the same idea, simple, elegant, and, and efficient. And that might be fundamental or real if it's not simple if it's hugely complex you know it's not really elegant all this computation has to be done to do it then it's not likely to be fundamental it's likely to just be hypothetical but never be real because the real world has limits and restrictions so that's sort of my my take on that but uh, it's you know it's not a zero or a one but uh, the fact that that uh, one way is very efficient and the other way is very inefficient makes me think that a real system that's evolving would have to be the efficient one. The inefficient one would never evolve. It would self-destruct under the weight of its own needs, its own resources. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, hi Tom. Hello. I had all this, all this, this time uh, this question. Uh, are other reality frames almost identical to us or just similar? Well, I have been in other reality frames that are very similar to us. Never been in one that was identical to us. And I've been in some that were nothing at all like us. So identical would be the only one I've never, I've never seen. I've never seen one that's exactly like this so no parallel like yeah that. i didn't i've never seen any that look like they were parallel universes of, of here no never they all seem to be things that have evolved on their own path now sometimes many times the rule sets are very similar 
And I think that's because it's not easy to come up with a rule set that's stable. You know, to come up with a rule set that, you know, that uh, a rule set is all the rules by which stuff can interact, and then you have initial conditions, and then you punch the run button, and that creates a simulation. Okay, that's the virtual reality I'm talking about. There's not that many sets of initial conditions and, and rules that'll end up with a reality that's stable. That's a place that can spawn or evolve things like us, avatars, so that consciousness can come in and make choices. You see, so I think that's why often the rule sets are very similar because there's not that, there's not that many ways you can do that. It's a tough, it's a tough thing to do. And I don't even know that this one is stable. I mean, after all, one day we're all supposed to be reduced to you know, what, hydrogen gas, or just ray, you know, strandum, uh, you know, elementary particles, second law of thermodynamics, you know, that uh, one day the whole universe will be disordered. Well, you know, that's not really stable, but it's stable long enough for all this evolution to take place to give platforms for consciousness to have avatars so they can make choices. So it works probably not long-term stable in that sense of long-term being hundreds of billions of years, but long enough. So I think that's a hard thing to do. It's to replicate, no, I mean. Yeah. Now we could, of course, you, you can take a, you know, it's digital. Whenever you have a digital reality, it's very few constraints. You could take our reality at some time, take a copy of that, put it over here in another processor, and start it up Again, right? We wouldn't make the same choices. There'd be different choices, and the whole thing would end up evolving off on its own path. So by the time you got to it years later, it'd be a, it'd be significantly different. So, you know, evolution's just like that. There's a large degree of of randomness in evolution. I have another question. In one of another talks that I I saw you, you talked about how the big cheese made his rounds in this reality frame. Well, well, and so that makes a reality frame have certain relevance or not. I don't know. Yeah. What no. does it mean that he made, he made his rounds here? I don't remember saying he made his rounds, but I'll try to, you know. <laughs> Sounds like a doctor, right? You're going to see all his patients. No, no, I got it more like a tour of duty or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, you know, I the the end of the day I called the big cheese. Of course, is that's just a, a name I gave it because I'm trying to keep people from taking it all too seriously. I don't want people to get wrapped up around, you know, uh, the big cheese who happens to be what I said was like the 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 CEO of N Division. You know, that sort of thing. Well, I make that in jest because I don't want people to get too serious about it. Um, but it is an entity that has some um, authority, if you will, over all the things going on in N-Division. It's kind of got a responsibility. Whenever you have a system, any sort of system other than a random one, whenever you have an ordered system with some, some you know, lower entropy, there needs to be management. If you have rule sets, then the rules get broken sometimes. Now, not necessarily the, rules, the rule set that the, evolved the reality, but you know, we have rule sets like in this reality, entities just cannot come barge in here and you know, create havoc. Just like you wouldn't, let the, you wouldn't let the teenagers come into the third grade class, right, and steal the third graders' lunch pails. You, know, you just wouldn't allow that, that's forbidden. So we have rules like that too. And those rules need to be one made up and find you know, good rules rather than bad rules and that takes some thought. And they also need to be policed in the sense that if people break them that there's some consequences. And just like real life, sometimes they get broken and there are no consequences. They get away with it and sometimes not. But so you need administration if you like because you have rules and rules require administrators and this big cheese then is that is a metaphor for that function of of management that needs to be in a very complex system 
you can't have a complex system that doesn't have any oversight, doesn't have any management. It will have a tendency to de-evolve and disintegrate because the rules will tend to be broken and as all the rules go, go away and so on, then you end up with anarchy and then you end up with a situation that's very hard to learn from and it just isn't good. So you kind of need to keep the rules. But he's an entity now. Yeah. Well, you know, what's an entity? Again, I said uh, to an earlier question that, you know, we communicate with something, we turn it into a, something looks like us and an entity looks like us and acts like us. This entity could be just another, well it is in that sense, just another piece of the larger consciousness system. This is operating at a different level than us. So it's like us, you know, call ourselves entities, but we're just pieces of the larger consciousness system. So we could say that it's just the larger consciousness system doing that function. We could also say it's the larger conscious system doing our function too. It's all just the large, you know, it's all one thing, just doing all these various functions. We can look at it that way. So when I say it's an entity, um, I say that in a general way. Not that he lives in a house and goes home, you know, to his wife and kids and dog and that kind of stuff, you know, not quite like that, but just some sort of metaphor of a, of, an awareness of what's going on and a mission to keep it under control, to keep the rules working and to see that, you know, everything is, everything is okay. So that's, you know, that, that's the sense of, of an entity. I, I break these things out functionally. There's a function that needs to be done. That's a management function. Okay. Well, if I'm going to communicate with people from this planet, I have to use words like that function is management because that is the closest I can get to it. But it's just the function that needs to do that. The, the free will awareness unit and the individuated unit of conscious are all functions that have to take place. There's all reasons why that function has to be there. And then we name them and make entities, separate entities out of them so that we can talk about them. Otherwise, we can't talk about it if we don't do that because we have to talk about things in terms of our experience, which is, you know, what we get here. So everything has to be translated back to this physical reality's experience base. That's why we have entities and not just abstract pieces of the larger consciousness system because that's too hard to talk about for us. We can't, we don't get that entity we kind of get. So the entity is only a very general term for a function that has to be done. And in the times that I have been uh, uh, in other reality systems, I've, you know, I've noticed that there is a management function that happens. Things happen that, that uh, obviously there's somebody in charge. And there's different things in charge, different places. And there are, um, you know, so you not only have n division, but you get n plus one division and n minus one division. And then there's some kind of management function above that. So that's about all I've seen. Whether there's any management function above that, I have no idea. Never had any contact with that, but I've had at least those two levels. And generally, I think in consciousness, it's a very flat organization. There's not a lot of hierarchy involved in it. It's a very flat organizational structure. Because the, the idea is you let everything go to be however it is as best you can. But you do have to have certain rules. And those rules are very general. And there's a lot of leeway mostly in those rules. And it isn't until something gets really critical that anything's generally really done about it. Because after all, this is free will. It's not us free will interacting with each other if somebody's constantly, you know, moving our piece around on the board to suit themselves because there's a lot of rules. You have to pretty much be able to do whatever it is that you do, whether it's good or bad, and that's okay. So the, there's a minimum amount of hands-on, but there's a lot of nudging and help.
Hey Tom, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, reincarnation. A couple of questions that I had on that subject were, um, basically when you die, is there like a length of time, or is it instant before you, you come back? Is that variable, is it something you decide to do? And also, is it possible for you to be back at the same point twice or multiple times? Um, so you split down and maybe have somebody in this room could also be me, and I guess that's where I'm coming from. Okay, uh, first question is, uh, what's the time like on returning? That's up to the individual. Now, I have lots of individuals that say, you know, that they're not coming back here. No way you're going to get me back to this place because they're, they're having bad experiences. You know, they're struggling. They've got a lot of fear. They've got a lot of ego. Life has not been fun. And basically, they have that attitude. And their question is, do I really have to come back here? You know, and the answer is no, you don't, but you probably will. See, because even though you think this is a terrible place, that's mainly because you're making it a terrible place. It's not so much it's terrible on its own, it's terrible because what we bring to it, we collectively bring to it, is why it's so terrible. So once you leave here, um, you get to come back when you're ready. When you feel like you've digested what you've just done, learned all the lessons you can learn, figured out where it is you think you need the most work, and then you kind of try to get a situation that, that is going to stimulate the learning that you need to learn. So that may take time. So the more times you've been around the block, then the more time it takes to plan the next one. At the low end of it, you haven't been around the block too many times, you jump in, you jump out, you don't, doesn't matter. You're just getting experience. You don't have enough experience yet to be deciding, you know, you need to work on this instead of that, you need to work on everything. You know, so there's, there's differences there. Um, let's see, that was one part of your question. How long does it take? It just depends whenever you want to. Uh, can we uh, reincarnate into the past? Or into the same place. So could you split down and be in two different places at the oh, same time? Could you do it twice? Could you, yeah. could you incarnate two in, in two, two different you, avatars? Two separate experiences at the same yeah. time. Yes, of course. That's the, uh, you know, the um, individuated unit of consciousness can have two free will awareness units. Okay. And they can be down there at the same time. They can even be interacting. They can even be, you know, mother and daughter or father and son or brother and sister or whatever or however. Or they may be on opposite sides of the planet. It depends. See, typically it's a one, one individual, one at a time. And the reason for that is it's more efficient in learning that way. Learning is cumulative. So it's, you know, what you learn now will change what you can learn the next time. So that's why it's not equivalent to send, let's say if you could duplicate yourself and, and have, uh, you know, 10 of you all go out and each one of you go through one grade. You know, you do kindergarten and your other one did this and it doesn't work that way because you got to do kindergarten before you can do first grade, before you can do third grade, you got to accumulate serially because you can't take all of those unrelated things and bring them together. So because it's cumulative, serial works better than parallel. But certain learning situations, parallel is wonderful because you really can get an in-depth connection between somebody. There was a result that uh, Donna brought up to me once that uh, um, Weiss, right, Dr. Weiss, he had, uh, he talked to a lady who seems to have had three incarnations here at one time, and it was on three sides of an issue. She was a Jewish woman who had been snatched up by the Gestapo, she was a member of the Gestapo, and she was, yeah, just a regular soldier or something in, in the war. So she saw this conflict, which was evidently a very significant thing for her, from these different viewpoints, you see. And if you can, because you're, you're still kind of communicating, you're taking all this data in, you've got a, an empathic connection with all the other parts. And uh, that helps you see things in a different light. Oftentimes I've seen two incarnations at the same time between P1 
people who are related like father, son, mother, daughter. Particularly if they had issues uh, with any of those. Let's say they had an issue with uh, an overbearing, you know, they were very overbearing as a parent. They're very forceful, very demanding on their children. Well, when they come back and do their review, they say, yeah, I know, that's tough love. That has to be done that way. Well, do, giving them a father-son connection, you see, now it gets both viewpoints at once. And then they can see what it's like on the other side of the fence, what that other person feels like when they're being dominated or being dominating, you see? Right. Either way, and it's an aha moment, they learn something. So that's why those kind of close relationships can be the same oversoul doing a double because it's a lesson they need to learn and that lesson is best learned from double perspectives. Okay. So it's not often. Most of the time it's single because now you've done two that help each other learn. But typically if you're just here to learn from a situation, you need to learn that because the next time you're going to be at a different place and you'll learn different things different ways. And trying to do all of them at once doesn't help. You know, if you sent out a thousand incarnations all in the same time and brought them all back, you'd maybe only get the value out of you know, as much as you would have out of one or two or three. It's just not efficient to parallel process something like that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Tom. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I don't know how to um, ask this question, but as I was sitting here, he actually, part of my question he asked, but then I, other stuff just started coming into my head. So I'm <laughs> sorry if I just... I'm rambling, but um, my my pet came to my mind when I was sitting here. Do animals also um, get reincarnated, and can they come back as people? Sure, that can happen. Doesn't happen real often, but it can happen. Animals are conscious, just like we are. Um, anything that has a finite decision space, in other words, can make choices. It can decide to do this or that. If it's a choice-making entity, that's consciousness. That's what consciousness does. It makes choices. So, yes, your dog or cat or whatever can make choices. You've seen it make choices. And uh, yeah, right? you've seen your cat, and it looks at you, and it looks at the table, and it looks at you, and looks at the <laughs> table, and it's thinking, can I get to the table and get that food and then get out of here before she gets from there to here, you know? <laughs> you can see the wheels turning, yeah. and you know they're thinking, and they're, they're deciding what it is they're going to do. Um, sure, and animals are doing the same thing we're doing. They are making choices and growing up the, you know, the quality of their consciousness based on the choices. They're just doing it at a different level with a lot smaller decision space. Okay, so consciousness can come in all kinds of sizes and sorts, right? So they're doing this at a, at a simpler decision space. So yes, they can. And if they do this and progress and progress to the point that it's no longer that challenging, okay? They've outgrown that form of challenge. Well, then they can do something else. You see, they can come back as some other form. You can, you can, you can play, you know, player. You can be the player for any kind of avatar. It's just whatever you're ready for. If you're ready for the human experience, it doesn't matter that you've been, you know, it's your last, last time you were Lassie, you know. Lassie's pretty clever. He always somehow gets Timmy out of the well. So, you know, Lassie probably, uh, you know, gets a go at the human form. But it's not like that happens all the time and that all animals have to progress up and go through that and so on. Everybody's just working at wherever they are. It's just a possibility that uh, you can move on. It's also not necessary that you come back here into this particular virtual reality. There are other virtual realities, and if you want to get out of here and go to a different one, you can. Most people don't because they kind of know the ropes here. They know how it works. They're familiar with it. And usually you're better at a game if you know how the game works and you're familiar with it. So people tend to come back because this is what they know. You, know? you could go to a different reality frame, but if you have no experience there and the rules and the, and the culture and everything's totally different, you're going to be a fish out of water for a while until you catch on. So that's 
you know, that's the choice. That's why most people end up coming back here. Even the ones that don't like it here, you know, that goes away after a while. You know, it's not very long before that's kind of a bad dream. And then after that, they get really bored. And then after that, it's like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And then it's like, well, let's get back to work. And, you know, here they are again. So it doesn't matter how much they really don't want to come back here. That, that doesn't last very long. That kind of answered my next question because I'm, I'm sick of this place. You're really sick of this place. <laughs> I've done my part. I feel like I'm, yeah, like really, I yeah. feel like I'm, I'm bored. Like this is Mario 3 all over again for me. Like I, yeah. I know where all the hidden mushrooms are. I'm ready yeah. to start yeah. off. Well, you may, get an, else. you may get another situation. You probably will have a situation here. That's just more likely, but it could be someplace else. But you have experienced what you've experienced because of the situation that you're in, and you may decide to do something dramatically different. Which is why I feel like I'm, I'm done, because I, I describe myself as someone who, who just wants to just always do and help other people. So in my past life, I was probably like a real witch or something. <laughs> like, I was mean, because now I just feel like, you know, whatever, like, Literally, I've been, I've been through a lot, like so many people have, and it's I just I just feel like I've done my my good deed for for me being here. Um, well, good. I'm, then you feel I'm opening up a successful. shelter for homeless people. Like literally, like I I don't know what else I am to do. So when I'm transitioned, I want to go somewhere else <laughs> and plant a garden somewhere else. Like that's just how I feel. So well, that's fine. Yeah, you have free will. So that means that nobody ever tells you what to do. You have free will, and never will anybody say, you have to do this. Never. You will always have a choice. That's what we are as consciousness. We make choices. And if we don't have free will, then the whole system falls apart. It doesn't work. It only works if we have free will. Free will is necessary for consciousness. And consciousness is necessary to express free will. The two of them are logical set. They don't come separately. Consciousness and free will. So you will always be able to say no or yes to anything and you'll be given choices. If you say no, you say what else you got on the menu? You know, what else can I do? And they'll give you those things and eventually you'll make a choice or you'll try something and that'll work and so on you go. And if, I, if it doesn't work then I'm zapped back here, right? <laughs> <laughs> not, not unless you want to. You see, you go where you want to. So everybody's here as a volunteer, not as a, not as a forced labor. It's a place to learn. But you have to, you know, you'll, you'll feel the need then to learn, to grow up. Just hanging out is not enough. You need to make progress, and you know that. And there may be various places where you can make progress. And then any one of those are fine. You know, everybody in the whole consciousness system, they're all doing the same thing from the dogs and cats and bumblebees and monkeys and you know the people and other kinds of critters and things that are in other reality systems. Everybody is just trying to grow up and become love because that's what it's all about, that's right. you see? And it sounds like you've been pretty successful this time, so good. But you know, there's always something to learn. There's always something to do, something to grow from. So I doubt that you're really done. You will probably meet some challenges Anybody who says, all right, I solved all the challenges, <laughs> is really asking for something. Hi. I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is to kind of tie with the same subject of different realities. So when we... Uh, hear people bound by space, time, physical limitations. When we hear about entities from other realities, sometimes it may seem that they have it easier just because they have less limitations. Um, when you compare, when people come here for certain, not people, sorry, consciousness comes here for certain challenges, how much more complicated is our reality from others? It's, Do they have it easier? Yeah, it's similar, okay? Now, it depends. When you say complicated or challenging, I have been to some realities that I would say were much more challenging than this one. 
And uh, the reason for that was they had de-evolved a great deal. And it was, a, it was uh, basically what you would expect out of, out of uh, a reality system where everybody was looking out for number one and there was no trust. There was lots of fear everywhere. Um, there was very little love anywhere. That would be a really big challenge to deal with. So it's a place that kind of went bad and is still uh, struggling to turn around. So I'd say that's a much more challenging here. This, this makes this like a, a cakewalk, you know, compared to that, you know, we're all doing good and full of love and peace. But it's all relative. I've also been places that have been a lot more peaceful and loving than here. So it kind of depends. You go to a place that's very peaceful and loving, and it feels good, but you find out you don't learn as much. You go to a place that's too challenging, and you don't learn as much either because you're overwhelmed with the challenge. So you tend to find a place that just kind of suits you, that is not too hard, not too easy. If it's too easy, you just kind of like kick back and things go by and you end up, after it's all done, of wasted most of your time. You just didn't, you weren't challenged enough. So you, you end up with something that works. And that's part of the process after you die here is to find out what works, what's going to work best for you and then go there, okay? Now, this reality that we're in works really well for all sorts of people. It's not, you know, it, it's not really, a, you know, on the, on the scale of evolution. It's not like it's all peace and light and there are very few challenges. It's not like it's all death and destruction. It's kind of floating around in the middle and there's lots of challenges here because we could evolve either way. We can evolve, you know, or de-evolve. So it's kind of an interesting place with a lot of uh, potential. So that's why it's a popular place. Uh, my next question was going to be on a different subject about the double slit experiment. I am not a physicist myself, but I spoke about this experiment with a person who is in physics. He's done Andron Collider and he's working with particles. And what he explained to me is that the reason why uh, let's say an electron acts as a particle if there is a detector and as a wave if there is no detector is because the only way to detect an electron is to interact with it because of how small it is. Yes, a lot of physicists uh, believe that but it's not true. It's a common belief. If you took a whole bunch of physicists together and asked them that, most of them would probably say that. And the reason they would say that is that is a way to try to make it all seem physical. Okay, what you're really doing there is it's the detector has to interact with the particle to detect it, right? So that's something that, that's a problem. Well, in, and I don't know if this was the first one, but in uh, 2000, an experiment was done, I think it's Scully et al., and I've shown it in some of my, my work, and it was a touchless experiment. They did detect, but they never touched the particle with any energy at all. Is it the one where you use mirrors with lasers? Or? Yeah, no, what it does is you have two particles come in and they hit a piece of plastic that has a property that when the particle hits, it creates a pair of entangled particles, okay? So you end up with two entangled particles. So they let one set of particles go do the double slit experiment. The other set of particles that are completely different particles, they do the detection. Different particles. Okay? So they can detect by where these particles go what these two particles, you know, where they came from. Because both of them contain which slit they came from. Both of those. So it was a touchless kind of experiment. So you could determine what slid a, part, you know, a particle went through without ever touching it with any energy at all. And what they found out was what they expected to find out, and that was that the detection makes no difference whatsoever. Now, they had already found that out years before, even back in the early 20s, they came to that conclusion for two reasons. One, they looked at the detection methods and the detection methods were such that there wasn't enough energy transfer 
to have any effect. It was, it was negligible. Okay, so they didn't feel that that was it. And secondly, that if they left the detectors running but didn't record the data, it worked just the same. So detectors with their energy continue to run but you don't record the data, it still, it still works because there's no data. That's why they decided that information was the key. It was the which way information. Not the detection process, but the which way information is the key to it. But a lot of physicists still hold on to that idea, even though, what, in 2000, we're all, you know, we're at 16 already, right? We're 16 years later from that experiment. Physics <coughs> students still hold on to that because that makes sense to them as a physical explanation, and nothing else does. But right from the beginning, we've known that that's not the case. That's really not the way it works, but it's a belief that's held dearly by a lot of physicists. So I would just disagree with your, with your friend that that's the way it works. <laughs> and I think if he dug into it, he would find that other uh, quantum physicists would do that. Because see, physics is a very specialized field, just like medicine. You know, you go to a brain surgeon for brain surgery, you don't go to your GP for that because the GP wouldn't do very well. And it's the same thing with physics. You have particle physicists and you have quantum mechanics and you have all sorts. You know, there's, there's dozens of different specialties inside of physics. And the people that are physicists that are not in quantum mechanics theory, they just really don't know. Just like the, the GP doesn't really know all the details of brain surgery. He doesn't have to. It's not his thing. And every doctor can't know all the details of every specialty. It's just too much. So most physicists don't know, really, the details of quantum theory because it's not really what they do. All they get is the kind of the scuttlebutt and the side stuff and what they got in graduate school and that sort of thing, but they don't get the in-depth stuff. See, if that were the case, if it were physical and it was just a matter of those detectors, energy interfered with it, well, that's a particular, it's a physical process. It's simple. You send the energy in, it somehow messes with that particle, and that's what uh, causes the decoherence. Okay. Well, if it were all physical, why would you have Bohr and Heisenberg and Planck and all of these people making quotes like, you know, if you don't think this is totally, you know, foreign and outside of everything you ever thought of, then you just don't understand it yet. If, was it, if it wasn't really that big a deal, oh, it's just these particles do that, you know, and that's the way it works, then it, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But it is a really big deal. And that's why you have Feynman, you know, you have Feynman saying that nobody will ever understand this. Because the fact that it interfered with the, you know, with the, the detection was a problem. Feynman knew that that wasn't it, or he would have said, oh, I understand it. Look, it's just this detection does that. Well, he didn't. Feynman said, nobody will ever understand this. And he was a very hotshot uh, quantum mechanics theorist. So that's uh, common belief, but not accurate. Okay. And if, you, you know, if your friend looks at um, Calgary Workshop, I put that uh, slide up of that experiment along with the, with the title and who did it. And, and um, I'll look it up. He can, yeah, you can look it up. It's a, it's a uh, delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. So not only do they use the, the entangled particles so they don't have to touch the ones that they're measuring, but then after they've collected the which way data from the tangled pair, they erase it. After the, after the, the, the primary pair have already are done, they give a longer flight path for the, for the uh, they call idlers. A, that's two, they have the, the signal particles and the idler particles. The idler particles are given a longer flight path. So not only do they erase the data, but they erase the data after the first two particles, the signal particles, have already done. It's already, the, the screen's already been imprinted. Then they erase the data. And what they find out is that when they erase the data, they don't have the which way information anymore. They get the diffraction pattern, even though they erased the data after the experiment was over. Okay. And they expected that too, because that's been done lots of times also. 
you know, none of that was a surprise in, in the year 2000. The last time that was a surprise was probably, you know, in the 1920s. Okay. Thank you very but much. But it's not common knowledge, even to physicists. You're welcome. <laughs>